overseas Chinese migration. It's also very important to think about South Pacific. So, so also business uh, network or economic activities also we, we can. We need to pay more attention. This is one thing. The other thing is, this is history, but also history, but 1980s on, so-called new migration started from mainland China, also from Taiwan. They, they are a sort of small capitalist. They have funds and investing directly from uh, original place. So it's not uh, the previous migration network. So we have three different kinds of uh, migration pattern or migration. So, so far we are uh, more interested or more, more uh, important to analyze the third so-called new migration. So how new migration entered? So this is in the, in the conference, uh, Professor uh, O uh, from Tasmania University introduced how uh, Russia entered uh, South Pacific. So we also uh, follow uh, the South Pacific and China relation uh, before 1980s and after 1980s. So uh, this is uh, not only political issues but also from the migration uh, studies perspective, uh, economic activity from area surrounding South Pacific now coming in very new stage. So how how to prepare or how to join, how to set up some uh, more multilateral relations from Pacific maritime regions point of view are becoming more important. Not with, not just choosing one country. More South Pacific regional based idea trying to develop uh, as a whole region or interrelated region. That is uh, my observation. After 1990, when uh, mainland China uh, joined a sort of international maritime law, or they, they accepted this kind of international maritime law, uh, start to develop a sort of maritime policy. So now, uh, maritime policy entered uh, in different ways. Uh, first of all, we are very clear to remember the Spratly Island issues is a sort of Asia-Pacific Maritime Sea. China claimed very strongly uh, the a sort of Spratly Island issues, but also uh, it faced uh, uh, like Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan uh, also claimed these uh, own islands holding or maritime territory or maritime uh, economic zone. So uh, we have these lessons. So uh, for China uh, by claiming a sort of sovereignty, uh, a sort of extension of the idea of land, territory into maritime sea compared to uh, American continent, or compared to uh, African continent, Asia is so interrelated, interconnected. So even the relation, maritime relation between Japan and Korea, uh, just on the middle set the border or a boundary line. So always uh, a sort of overlapped. So maybe from now on, not only uh, the idea of extension of land boundary of, of territory to, to, to maritime sea, this is not only mainland China, but also 
Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, basically uh, over the world, they took this kind of policy. But actually, they came very uh, difficult situation just to set boundary. But the problem is now undersea natural resources came out, like oil or gas or minerals. So uh, the problem is much more com complicated uh, during the period of fishery based international negotiation. So uh, on the one hand, I feel very uh, difficult uh, for the moment to settle this kind of international dispute on maritime sea or uh, territorial boundary extension to maritime boundary. But in the future from maybe uh, long lessons from Pacific, for example, without claiming exclusive holding, mutually communicating each other for the mutual benefit, uh, without setting up this kind of uh, uh, purpose or this kind of policy, uh, it is uh, always uh, new conflict might emerge, I'm afraid. So uh, to me, on the one hand, by tracing back the history of this kind of usage of maritime sea, and then how how to set up the the future. Uh, but for the moment, uh, the case of Asia, uh, including Korea, Japan, China, uh, Taiwan, Southeast Asian countries, uh, so many uh, sort of maritime dispute conflict are now uh, existing. So. So far, maybe uh, better policy is just postponing without raising up the claim directly is a device for the people of these uh, regions. So to me now, I'm very much interested in uh, UBC. UBC is not the University of British Columbia, Union of Baltic Cities. It's in Europe, Northern Europe. Uh, you have a long history of Hanse Hanseatic League of Northern Sea related or Baltic Sea related. Now UBC is under uh, EU and joining uh, more than 100 cities and based on cities they gather together and then discuss their mutual interest. This uh, Union of Baltic Cities is not very rigid, not like nation state. According to agenda, they join, uh, they raise their hands and then discuss. So this is another, uh, to me, very interesting uh, sort of uh, historical uh, example in Europe. And East Asia has a long history of maritime port relations. Uh, so sea is not divided sea, but also connecting sea. So I'm, so far I'm thinking, uh, instead of dividing into nation state, the coastal cities, port cities, uh, are joined together to discuss this kind of maritime issues. It's rather similar idea of Pacific Ocean. Each island is not, not rigid territorial nation state idea like one one city or one community are connected to each other very widely or rather freely so I think uh, to me this kind of uh, coastal cities uh, relations might uh, enter more deeply on the discussion of maritime sea might some new direction we can find. Uh, so far I'm thinking like this.